Sarah Badwe from Horse Racing Nation. Pleased to be joined by Scott Shapiro, Twin Spires expert handicapper, Churchill Downs live analyst, and you're all over the Twitter sphere as well, Scott. Here to talk about the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. How are you doing today? Good, Sarah. Good to be joining you. I've really appreciated you bringing uh, a lot of good guests onto your uh, Horse Racing Nation interviews, a combination of people I'm familiar with and then those I've gotten to uh, know. But uh, great job by you and Ed and the team and uh, excited for the Breeders' Cup. And I think the Philly and Mare Sprint is one of the more enjoyable or races I'm most excited to gamble on. So uh, let's get to it. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some big upsets in this race before, uh, and hopefully we can find some prices in here because we have a full field of 13 horses, and we have last year's winner in CC. We have a tepid 3-1 to favorite in Goodnight Olive, the number eight horse for trainer Chad Brown. We have last year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies uh, champion Echo Zulu all the way to the outside. This is a full field of those Philly and Mare sprinters, and at first glance, uh, is there anybody that you can even cross off as a, a total toss? Well, I think from a gambling perspective, there's a couple of the shorter priced horses, one, maybe two in particular that I'm going to probably try not to beat, but it wouldn't be as if I'd be shocked if they beat me. Maybe a couple long shots that I think will be up against it. I think Hot Peppers is probably a little bit too slow and is unlikely to be loose on the lead. Sterling Silver, probably a little bit up against it. But you basically made a great point. I mean, this is a wide open race, and that's pretty much the reason I'm looking forward to diving in and, and gamble on it as much as I am. And we also have the only Japanese contender this year um, in the number six chain of love. We saw what kind of total domination they had at the Breeders' Cup last year that they've had uh, in different international events thus far this year, but only one coming over. And, you know, I kind of doubt they would send only one horse that didn't have a shot. Very tough read for me for this horse. That's just three for 22 when you look at it at first. But I guess when you face 13, 18 horse fields all the time, those third place efforts and getting a few wins isn't too bad. I would think that maybe the trip to Kentucky was a lot more difficult to make as opposed to the trip to California. Maybe that's why we're not seeing so many of them. Obviously, the, the West Coast a little easier to get to from Asia. But uh, you would think that she would be live. I mean, if we see another Japanese horse winning a big price after last year and uh, I don't have her be kind of tough to uh, go to sleep I think on Saturday night <laughs> and I know someone that uh, is cursing the uh, disc staff results of last year is someone that we both know well with Ed DeRosa having uh, quite the bet on Dunbar Road who just got nosed out by Marche Lorraine so whenever I talk to him I'm going to remind him that he might not want to discount Chain of Love <laughs> too quickly um, who for the most part in her career was on the turf. And once they switched her to the dirt, she's hit the board at every start since then. Um, the only time she did not do so was at Maidan and that was versus the boy, which was the golden Sheehan won by Switzerland. So very stiff competition in there. And I think the horse that is opting to take on that stiff competition in the Colts and geldings in the regular sprint is Kamari who honestly may have been the favorite in this race. Oh, I think Kamari definitely would have been the favorite in here, not to take anything away. Those last two efforts, I mean, I don't want to say they came out of nowhere because she was always very talented. She showed some serious ability, but then kind of, you know, underwhelmed through a number of starts. I liked her a bit in the Derby City Distaff, which she ran okay in, but those last two efforts are just so big. And I get it. I mean, I think Jackie's Warrior without Jack Christopher is the clear horse to beat in the sprint, which I know you'll talk about in one of your other videos. But outside of that, I think Kamari has as good a chance as anyone. And if Jackie's Warrior doesn't run his race for whatever reason, I think she could win that race. So bigger purse, a little bit more allure. I get why Wesley's doing it, but probably had a better chance to win this one. And I think that one of the reasons that he mentioned as for why they chose that race over this one is because he wanted the six for her rather than the seven, this Philly and Mayor sprint being at seven furlongs. When you're looking at these races, do you take into consideration the, the little variances in a furlong or, or less for some of these horses? Because you have horses that are stretching out. You have some that are shortening up. Is seven furlongs anybody's uh, serious game going into this? I think there's a few horses here that benefit for sure from seven furlongs. The favorite, Goodnight Olive. I know six furlongs might be a little too sharp for her. Um, in general, I'd say 
You know, you want horses that have a little bit more stamina, the seven furlongs, the one turn mile type configurations. One horse that we'll talk about uh, that I like, I don't love the seven furlongs for much, and that's slammed. But overall, I think you got to have a little bit more stamina. I don't use it too, you know, it's kind of a separator, I'd say, Sarah, more than something that I look at immediately. But there certainly is a difference between horses that like seven eighths and, and three quarters. I agree with you. I really look for those horses that I think uh, sort of have the seven furlong specialty, or at least have shown that they can handle it before. I don't necessarily want a horse that is going this far for the first time, and especially not at a short price. One that isn't a short price that you mentioned is Slammed, who is 15 to 1 on the morning line, gets that rail draw. And in these one turn races at Keeneland, the rail is just not the place to be. Um, so I, I didn't necessarily have her on my radar, but I think that she's completely off it with that rail draw. I've been so impressed with this New Mexico bread since I got beat by her at Del Mar on July 28th. I know you're probably better than me at the visual side of things, analyzing horses based on what you see, but it didn't take a uh, specialist for me uh, to be able to see how much of a serious filly she was. She dominated that day, came back to run second in the Rancho Bernardo. I think she's really talented, but you nailed it. I mean, I said the the seven furlongs was going to be tricky, but being drawn along the inside when trying to get that seven furlongs with plenty of other speed signed on, I'm not going to let her beat me necessarily because the price will be too too long and I've been a fan of her, but she's definitely up against it for a number of reasons. This is definitely also the toughest field that she's faced. So I think there's just enough going against her that – I'm not going to include her on my tickets, but at least she's not going to be too short of price if you are interested in her. I guess the horse that I don't feel as though I've ever been a huge fan of, but that I mean certainly warrants respect is the number four CC last year's winner of this race in a mild upset over horses like Bella Sophia and Gamine, even though that was a much shorter field than we're seeing in here. What do you do with this horse? She's she's the elder of the field as a six-year-old mare. She's obviously danced a lot of dances and been extremely successful. You have to respect her, but do you necessarily want to bet on her? I am going to let her beat me in here, Sarah. I expect her to be, you know, one of the favorites, you know, four to one on the line, the second choice on uh, Nick Tamaro's morning line. I just don't think she's the same horse as she was last year when she was six to one to win this race. And you mentioned it was a more compact group. Gamine was a heavy favorite, maybe gone the wrong way. I just don't think it was the best field we've seen in the Philly Mare Sprint, which is usually a very deep race like it is this year. She had the one race in the Princess Rooney, the grade two of Gulfstream that numbers wise fits with what she did last year when she was at her best but otherwise she's been a little bit underwhelming does make her third start of the form cycle but i also come a little concerned about her trip she's drawn towards the inside a horse that i think is best when she can sit outside and stalk um, she could get caught in a pretty tricky spot so all those things considered i'm gonna let her beat me I'm going to take a shot against too. I just, I don't like horses that I've seen at least um, a non effort from them, especially against a tough company that they're going to have to face again. And I was just really underwhelmed by her ballerina. She just did no running that day. And I know right. she did back to win, but that was a much softer spot. No, it definitely was. She was one to five for a reason that day. She now gets back to take on the likes of Goodnight Olive, Obligatory, Carmel Swirl, who finished second in that race, Travel Column Fourth. They're not in here. But yeah, this is a serious test. And uh, I, this is a horse I'm, I'm going to leave out of not only my horizontal wagers, but I'm going to try to knock her out of the trifecta as well. So for horses that we're leaving out to horses that we're including, who who makes the ticket in this spot for you? Well, I think the three to one favorite, Goodnight Olive, is a very horse to be against without a lot of with a lot of excitement. She just continues to move forward. Chad's managed her extremely well. He brought her back off three weeks rest, which is really not a part of his program. To run in the ballerina, he must have known she was at her best. And man, she put forth a huge effort that day at nearly six to one. She's got a win over this racetrack. She's the clear horse to beat in here. That doesn't mean I'm going to pick her and, and expect her necessarily to have to win, but I do think she's very likely to hit the board. I also think number seven obligatory is going to run a huge race. She just keeps getting better for Bill Mott. Little bit concerned the way the Keeneland track played through the majority of the fall meet where it was a little bit tough to make up ground. But I do think when there was contentious paces with horses that are legitimate off the pace types with a fair race shape to run at, they had a fair shake. And she's one of those horses, Sarah, that I think is better at seven furlongs than she would be at six. So it benefits her there. 
And I think there's a lot of speed. So I think obligatory is the horse I'm going to end up landing on here as a, at eight to one in a race that's pretty wide open. I am going to include the favorite though. Obligatory is definitely one that I saw as um, this seven for long distance really suiting her well. I mean, she just kind of always shows up, even if she doesn't get the money, she does need a setup. But I do think that she gets it. And here I agree with you about there being some speed in front of her. Um, and I, a lot of the speed I don't necessarily consider a win candidate, especially a horse like Hot Peppers, who I think that she really has an impact on how this race plays out but not so much so at the finish line. Um, Lady Rod has speed, and I think that she's kind of one that needs to be on the lead early in order to get the job done. She's also thrown in some clunkers when she doesn't have things go her own way. Uh, Good Night Olive isn't slow either. We saw in the ballerina, she sat just off of those two pace setters in Travel Column and Bella Sophia that were going at it early. And she, she made her move by the top of the stretch to go take those two on. So I think obligatory gets things her own way in here. I just kind of wonder if she's good enough against some of these other horses. And I ended up going to the other Belmont trainee in Frank's Rockette, who, uh, I mean, at one point in 2020, she put a win streak together and she ended up going for the Breeders' Cup sprint against the boys. Uh, so obviously a lot was thought of her. And I think that they also were trying to keep her at that six for a long distance rather than going for the seven. But what we've seen from her this year, from a horse that kind of seemed like maybe she was done to one that's really in the best form that she's ever been in. And I think in a lot of those second place finishes that were piling up and were definitely a red flag, she was having some uh, un unlucky trips. I mean, she was getting bad breaks or things just like weren't going the way that they should have for her, especially in that race against Kamari two back. I mean, she stumbled at the break. She broke from the rail in that very short field. And then she kind of had to rush up a little bit. She ended up being last early. She had to make a move through to the inside. And she looked like she was going to run away with that race until Kamari has suddenly refound um, this great form that she's in to run her down in the late stages in there. And I know Charlestown isn't exactly um, the most prestigious racetrack to have won your last uh, prep for a Breeders' Cup race in. But that win last time was actually her career best fire speed figure. And that best figure, as well as some of the ones that she's run prior to that, definitely make her a suitable player in a spot like this. And she's just so consistent. I mean, a horse that's run 23 times, that's been in the money, 21 of those. I just respect that a lot. You said the first thing that came to mind. I don't, I don't know where she rediscovered herself. She was so good early on. And then she kind of felt like, like one of those, you know, female horses that was like, ah, I've done my thing. I'm ready for the farm. I'm still going to try hard, but I'm not as fast. I mean, those two last even three races have, have really turned the tides. I mean, her and Kamari, kind of similar profiles. Frank's Rocket, though, more accomplished with the nine wins and over $1 million in earnings overall. So I totally see it. If she gets back, I mean, the Honorable Miss was a massive effort in terms of Brisnet speed ratings, 109. I mean, on the thoroughgraph, which is what I use for my you know number one performance rating or whatnot, huge number. She appears to be in the best form of her career, and I think she gets the right trip. And I think, too, I mean, I don't know that the Breeders' Cup was even necessarily on their radar because she was entered as an MTO not that long ago at Belmont at the Big A. That race ended up staying on the turf. She scratched out of there. And now here we are in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint as a serious contender. And I think that she'll at least be a fair price. I wouldn't consider her a long shot, but I think that she'll be a fair price for what she's accomplished so far. Yeah, I think you'll get a little more than the six to one. I think numbers players will be willing to back her, but she's got a lot of seconds. I think a lot of people just on name recognition kind of th think of her as a, a horse in the past. And this race, you know, unlike some of the other races, has been won, like you mentioned, by prices and just horses that are in the right form, not necessarily the class of the field every time. And I feel that way in general about sprints uh, for the most part. But uh, I think Frank's Rockette sets up to get a really good trip. I guess the one concern is that she's never hit the board and two starts at Keeneland, but that's a small sample size and could be somewhat circumstantial. I did see that. And that was my, that was my one uh, red mark against her. Um, I will forgive one of them since it was that Breeders' Cup sprint against the boys. I just don't think that she's quite that good. And she did also break from the rail in there. And as we've talked about, the rail is not the place that you want to be in these one turn races at Keeneland. So I can forgive that one. The other one, uh, well, I don't know, but I think she's just a better horse than she was at that time. So 
Um, I, agree. I, I can make the case for her. Echo Zulu all the way to the outside post 13. This is one that I think is just going to take money on name recognition. You have a lot of those more casual fans and horse players betting the races on a big day like Breeders' Cup Day. They're going to see last year's champion two-year-old filly and they might want to throw a couple dollars on her. What do you do with her? I am not going to let her beat me, but she's not a, like a key horse for me because I, you know, on numbers on the Brisnet numbers, and uh, you probably could speak to the buyers a little more than me. That last race in the Dogwood was not a step forward, but on thoroughbreds, it was a significant one, which is interesting because you know there was many thoughts that maybe this daughter of Gunrunner had seen better days and was you know going to retire on top. She comes back in the Dogwood. They scratch Steve Asmus and the trainer scratch Wicked Halo, who's also in here out of the race, and Echo Zulu just dominates that race for absolute fun now this is a much tougher group i think the outside draw assuming she doesn't break outward sarah from that far outside into the open space could work well because i don't think she's got the speed to get to the front in this group and if she did make the front i don't think she'd be able to sustain it but it does give ricardo santana jr some options from that outside kind of in a stalking position which i think bodes well if she's underneath that six to one morning line price i would agree total underlay if somehow she gets a little overlooked, I could see her being a viable option. And I mean, truly, she hasn't really done anything wrong. She is just a kind of a little light on the numbers compared to some of her older foes in this spot. But I, I think post 13 actually isn't the worst place that she could be because she will get to see what those other speeds are doing to the inside of her. She can sit a decent stocking trip. And honestly, I think that her Kentucky Oaks, as I know many other I would agree with was actually probably one of her better efforts, even though it was not a winning one because she showed that she could actually fight for it a little bit at a distance. That's not really as far as she wants to go. No, I agree with that 100%. I mean, it's her only loss ever. And you would think, oh, she put in a dud, you bounce back. But no, I mean, they went 46 and two. Everyone else that was around at the wire came from behind her. She put away the other early speed in that race. And really, as you said, fought hard to the wire to lose by just three lengths the way that race played out. And going a mile and an eighth, which a lot of us questioned, I know I can say I did, especially after that underwhelming effort when she was probably a little short in the fairgrounds oaks to start her three-year-old campaign. So it's really hard to knock her, but you said it best. If she gets over bet based on name recognition or just you know looking at the past performances and seeing all the ones, and I could see being a horse worth taking a chance. But there are others that I think will be a little bit shorter that I'm much more willing to take a strong stand against. I love it. All right. Well, one other horse that I think is kind of an insane bomb, but that I probably have to include somewhere a little bit is the very lightly raised Chi Town Lady for Wesley Ward. And I don't think we see Wesley Ward at Keeneland at 20 to 1 on the morning line very often. And this is a horse that is very light on the figures and just on the numbers. She really doesn't stack up in this spot, but she is one that I kind of made a little case for to finish underneath in the test at the seven furlong distance at Saratoga. And unfortunately, I made the case for her to finish underneath way too strong. And then she ended up winning um, that race. And there, upset winner, closing from way far back, off track, field wasn't really much. But does she get a pace set up? Is she a horse that's improving at the right time? Was that race just a configuration of the wet track and the weak field? I don't know. This is one that I think could sneak into some exotics at a huge price underneath somewhere. I think the last time I got Wesley Ward uh, right, you were probably 12 years old, but uh, <laughs> I get him wrong so often. But, you know, like we just talked, like you said, and I said before, like sometimes this race can be more about the horses that are coming into it in the best form and not necessarily have run the fastest number. She definitely has to take a big step forward, but she should get a good trip. I mean, Flavian Pratt should be able to save ground kind of mid pack to a little bit far off it. Winning the race would be a huge uh, accomplishment and, and pretty much shock many people. But if she picked up the pieces, I wouldn't be all that surprised. And I think she's going to get completely overlooked for connections that we know are more than uh, more than able to win a race like this. I completely agree. And I think that uh, if, if Wesley Ward ends up winning this race at a huge price, we'll all kind of look at our programs and be like, wait a minute, how did we not have this horse for <laughs> connections <laughs> like this? So... I want to use her in there somewhere, but I don't, I'll, I'll eat my words again. I don't necessarily think that she's a win candidate. It's definitely a tough test. She's never taken on older runners. She's got to run faster. A lot has to go right, but 
I will say we've definitely seen bigger upsets in the Breeders' Cup before. So, uh, you know, there's always going to be that one or one or two head scratchers. We like to try it as handicappers to find out where they're going to be well in advance. And then we usually, uh, you know, oftentimes beat ourselves up for missing maybe an obvious one here <laughs> or for connections, like you said, that should never probably pay 55 or $60. Right. Well, that's almost all the field. Is there anyone else that you want to touch on? Well, I just wanted to, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning Wicked Halo. I think, you know, this horse is, is, is a daughter of Gunrunner that I think Steve Asmussen has kind of managed perfectly, meaning that he hasn't taken, you know, center off to take on the, the best of the best. He's kind of taken on the second tier and she's rewarded him handsomely. Now she does have to get faster, but she's gotten faster in each of her last couple of starts. And I don't think Steve would be in any position to rush her back so quickly if he didn't think she was thriving. That's not his style at all he doesn't need to have a runner in here to make it an enjoyable breeders cup day he's got plenty of runners throughout including echo zulu in here and she's got the win over the track so a horse kind of where you speak with shy town lady i feel similar with wicked halo if she wins the race i'd be a bit surprised but i think you could do a whole lot worse underneath and i do think the 11 post is pretty favorable for the way she wants to run yeah, he's doing this move with Gunite as well. Those two horses that won the stakes races two weeks ago, wheeling them right back to the Breeders' Cup. That's not really his typical MO. So obviously these horses must be doing well for the winningest trainer in North America to be making these decisions for them. Obviously he knows what he's doing. And like you said, she has improved each successive time and has every right to take another step forward, especially on a stage like this. Um, there's only two horses that we haven't really mentioned, so I'll give them a quick mention. I suppose we have Edgeway, who is a five-year-old mare who has, uh, ran in uh, plenty of competitive races, mostly West Coast based. Uh, she did beat Slammed last time out. Slammed obviously is one that we talked about earlier is having come back to win at Keeneland. Um, she has yet to win at this seven for a long distance. She's tried it three times. Two of those were seconds. So, I mean, even she has an outside look. If you really like her, she was second in this race last year to CC. And then Sterling Silver as an insane price. I, I've tried to make a case for this horse a couple of times. And she's she's just always kind of light on the figures. She does have a second to Wicked Halo, and she was closing pretty stoutly. The trainer stat, though, graded stakes 0 for 30 plus. Don't love that. Yeah, yeah I see one for 69 for Albert Trani. I, I, Sterling Silver would be the most surprising result. Maybe Hot Peppers would be up there, but at least you know Hot Peppers is going to run a race out there, you would think, if she breaks well. In terms of Edgeway, Sarah, I do think she's a slight cut below, if not a full cut below. I think she's better in California. You mentioned the seven furlongs, probably wants a little shorter. And while Slam didn't beat her that day in the Rancho Bernardo, which is two back for Slam, the most recent start for Edgeway, Edgeway was on the outside, Slam was on the inside. Delmar, you wanted to kind of be in that outside trip. And it was also Slam coming off her much career best effort when Edgeway had rested in the race prior, you know, rested up for the Brancho Bernardo, hadn't raced since the Derby City Distaff uh, on the uh, Derby undercard. So she was fresh. So I like Slam more. I think the uh, inside draw for Edgeway is a little bit uh, of a concern as well. I think she does better when she's in those outside stalking positions. All right. So to close out, is Slam going to be the top pick or are you going elsewhere? I'm going to go with obligatory on top. I'm going to pick Goodnight Olive for second. I think she's a very deserving favorite. She's been managed very well and done very little wrong. And I am at a, you know, being sentimental. I'm going to pick Slam for third. If somehow she makes the lead, I think she's a serious horse. But she's, like you mentioned, for the reasons being on the inside, and we talked about the seven furlongs, she's up against it. But she's just going to be too big of a price for the horse that I've been following to just totally omit her. All right. Well, 781 for Scott. And I haven't decided who underneath, but Frank's Rock Cat, the number five, is going to be the top pick for me. Scott, thanks for taking the time to talk some Breeders' Cup with me. Really exciting race in this Philly and Mare Sprint. Where can everybody find you online and throughout the horse racing media world? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun joining you for the first time, Sarah. Thanks for having me. You can find me on Twitter at ScottChap34. I tweet out uh, you know, pretty much all the work that I do there. And then uh, you can find my uh, picks in, under the quote unquote expert picks videos on twinspires.com and on the app. I'll have them uh, throughout the Churchill Downs meet and uh, on Keeneland and for the Keeneland two days for the Breeders' Cup. And then, of course, on the Churchill Downs simulcast feed throughout our outstanding 
fall meet where hopefully we see a lot more stars after uh, seeing some on the stars of tomorrow card opening day last Sunday. All right, excellent. We'll make sure you give Scott a look at all of these places. And thanks again for chatting with me. Thanks, Sarah.